Um, so, you know, parking gets more tricky. So hopefully they don't find that new parking structure we just built underground. You know, it's, it's hidden. So hopefully they don't find that one. Um, so we have five presenters tonight. Uh, they each get five minutes to present, tell you about their company. And then you guys, your responsibility is to ask them the tough questions that they either haven't heard before or are very important to their business. Um, so our first company tonight is um, actually a company I've been working on for about six months now, um, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to let the founder, uh, Jim Vitek, talk about AppKey. All right, thanks, Kyle. Okay, so I'm going to talk about AppKey, and as any good pitch, it starts with a problem. Android developers don't know much. 400 million Android phones out there. Apps are a bigger reason why it's so popular, but they don't earn much money. Why? Only 1% of users upgrade from that free app you download out of Google Play to the paid version. It's only 99 cents, but only 1% of users do the upgrade. Another problem is that Google does not require you to put uh, billing information in your account. So you don't have to put a credit card in like you do with your iTunes account. Piracy is also really big on Android, uh, way more so than uh, Apple. And if you go to advertising, mobile ads kind of suck. So just dive in a little bit to mobile ads. So most ads that you see on mobile are actually for other apps, which is kind of a small market. So Sam's Club Android app, that sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> so you got where's my water and so on. And then you have ads for real stuff. But even the ads for real stuff, most of the time, aren't very valuable. They're ringtones, they're branding ads, or so on. It doesn't recognize the power of mobile. So how valuable, when you're using an app and you see an ad, how valuable is that ad if you're not in a position to act on it? And so that's why a lot of mainstream advertisers haven't gone in and poured more money into mobile. So fixing this attention problem, other ad vendors have resorted to some more aggressive advertising techniques. Some of them put a shortcut right on your home screen so you see it all the time. And some of it are using push notifications for ads. And they show up in your, they cause your phone to buzz and they show up in your notification bar and they're really annoying. So AppKey is different. AppKey is opt-in advertising. It goes on the home screen of your phone and if you use it, the AppKey enabled apps that you use are free. So how does this work? So apps are the incentive to get people to opt in. This isn't for everybody, but everybody knows somebody who will never pay anything for apps. This is for those people. There's a lot of them out there. It's as simple as if you get the free version of the app, they already upsell people to you know, click here and upgrade to 99 cents for the full version, get all the levels. What AppKey does is install AppKey and get this app for free. Raises awareness of AppKey, drives the user to install. The business model is that we generate revenue from these ads, and then we give an incentive to the developer who earned the install of AppKey, and then we take the rest of it and we proportion it out to the app developers based on usage of their apps on those phones. So at the end of the month, we look at how much money came in on each individual phone, which apps were used for how often, and pay proportionate to usage. And then AppKey gets some of the balance. The team working on this, is myself, I do the Android development. Kyle is doing building the platform. Hannah is working on marketing for us, and we outsource the website. So our current status is we have a beta live in Google Play. Uh, we have, the first app is already integrated. It's gonna be launching any day. It's from a developer in Denmark. Uh, and we have agreements with several local ad providers. And our ask is, we want your help. If you have an Android phone, download it, use it, let me know what you think. My email address is up here. And also, if you're an Android developer or you know someone that has an app that they want to make money off of, connect them with me. We'd love to work with them. So now we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and take questions from the audience. Okay. So, good to see you guys again. Great progress so far. Um, as an independent Android developer myself, I'm looking forward to possibly integrating. So you guys may be aware that like mobile monetization is super competitive right now and like getting those integrations into games and apps 
is getting very hard to do. Uh, developers, serious proposition, otherwise they're not even interested. Um, you know, what has your experience been thus far? And like, what is your, and maybe this is like also a marketing question. Yeah. So like, how do you plan to get the uptake on the integrations for developers? Because I think getting ad inventory is no problem, right. um, but getting the integrations is gonna be tough. So what do you think? Right, well we solved the good ad inventory problem. So as for instance, this slide is a real ad that I saw on State Street earlier today. And so it was showing me an ad to save money at LaMarza. I could click on that as a user, I would save money. As a company, I would earn money off of that transaction. So we've got that taken care of. What we're doing is we're looking for developers to partner with. It, it's kind of common sense that this ad is a little better than a lot of the other ads you'll see on mobile these days. What we need is we need some traction. We need to get some developers on board. We need to come up with metrics and figure out what the average revenue is per user so then we can extrapolate out how much developers will make on this. Right. So one-on-one, -on -one, developers have been receptive, uh, but we need a lot more biz dev than what we've had. Okay. Yes. Um, so what, what happens when some of your competitors get better at ad selection for in-apps? And all of a sudden, you know, a user doesn't have to have ads on their home page because they have relevant, beautiful ads in the app itself. Yeah. Uh, it really comes down to, you know, it's a competitive market. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot going on. But when the ad is on your home screen, you're more likely to see it. So if I'm walking down State Street, how often am I actually using Angry Birds as I'm walking down the street? You know, it's, it's not very often, but it's very often that I'll pull the phone out of my pocket, I'll call a friend, I'll check email, I'll send a text, receive a text, whatever it is. Every one of those times you pull it out of your pocket is an opportunity to actually see the ad. It's more impressions and more out of home impressions to where you can put location based advertising on it. Yes? Sounds very similar to trial pay they've been able to achieve. Have you been in contact with them and do you know how well they've done from a company standpoint? I, I've heard of them. Um, I think the difference is the home screen component. Uh, the home screen, I believe, is key. Um, if you just analog this to Google on the web, you know, they get a lot of impressions, they target ads. This is a lot of impressions, targeted ads. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I, I missed it. But is there a, a way for me to choose what what category of ads I'm picking up? Um, not so today, but there will be. This is this is version 0.9.4, <laughs> and there's a new UI design uh, that's quite a bit better that includes a user preferences page. Okay. So we're gonna target based on two things. One is actually explicit preferences. Just like when you sign up for Google Offers or Groupon, you say, what do I like? I'm gonna look at ads. Just give me ones that are relevant. The second thing is we're gonna drive context from the usage of that phone. So does this user frequent beauty salons? Does this user frequent Walmart? We can detect that. This is running as part of the operating system. We get a little breadcrumb trail of where the phone has been, and we can target based on that behavior. Have you tracked uh, the time of uh, the user usage of the application? Uh, right now we're not tracking usage, we're tracking uses. So we have an SDK, integrates into the app, it gets fired whenever the app launches. We count it every time the app launches uh, with a maximum frequency of once every half an hour. So we're looking at usage duration, it's just we haven't gotten there yet. Can you tell me more about the SDK? Like, how far are you along, and like, what's the integration look like uh, um, as far it's, as? It's on the website. Cool. All right. <laughs> yeah. It. I'll just check. Uh, it, it is for Java developers. Yeah. Um, so, it, and I wrote a wrapper for Basic for Android. Don't have one done for Unity yet, and I know there's a number of other tools, but they're on the list. Yes. This is great. Uh, if you're a developer today what can you guarantee in terms of revenue? So is it exclusive? Can you also do in-app advertising in this or? Um... Yeah, the, the requirement in the developer agreement says that you have to give the user at least 99 cents of value if they're an app key user. And so 
for instance, if you keep the in-app ads in there, fine as long as you're giving them an extra 50 levels in a game or whatever it is. It has to be equivalent to the paid version of the app in the store. So basically when I, so the developer when I give away that 99 cents, yeah. um, <coughs> there's some sort of revenue that you're gonna guarantee me that I'm gonna make and uh, place a Guarantee them a cut as a per install incentive if they're the first one on that phone. Other than that, it's only if the user makes revenue. Okay. Now remember, we're targeting the 99%. The 1% that pay for apps, they can still go pay for the app. We're just trying to make money off, more money off of those users that don't pay. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, we're going to move on to the next presenter. Thank you. While the uh, next presenter is getting set up, um, I want to thank our sponsors, um, A2 Geeks, and also uh, Zeller Lurie Institute for giving us this wonderful space. Um, and I just want to warn you guys that uh, starting next month, um, we're going to no longer have this space to meet in, but we're going to be meeting about a block that way um, in the new law school building. Um, so make sure to check the meetup group for the new location uh, next month. My name is Lisa Shetty, and I'm going to talk about uh, product debris that comes from a company called Ideomed that I work with. Uh, Ideomed is focused on chronic disease management solutions. Uh, we have offices in Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, about 11 people at this point in time. Um, our initial focus has been pediatric asthma, and we're starting to uh, expand a little bit into other chronic conditions, but we're going to talk today about <coughs> our asthma solution. Um, we like to talk um, in terms of a, a prototypical user. Um, we imagine a, a kid named Alex. Um, he's a, a typical asthma sufferer. Um, he has uh, three different medications that he's been prescribed to uh, manage his asthma um, and to treat his attacks. Uh, however, he regularly forgets to take his medication. Um, and as a result, his asthma is not in control. He has uh, weekly asthma attacks and has missed uh, 10 days of school in the past year um, and had three uh, ER visits. Um, the cost to his insurer is pretty high, um, uh, you know, several thousand dollars. Um, there's been studies that have shown that, that for out of control asthma, the costs are, are between seven and eight thousand dollars above if it is in control. Um, so that's key to our, to our business model. Um, we're selling the solution to, directly to insurance providers um, who are incurring that cost. And Alex is a technology user, so he's interested and excited about having uh, an application that will help him manage his asthma that uses technology. Uh, so our solution, a breeze, um, consists of a website for the parent uh, or a, another caregiver, um, and also a mobile app for the child with asthma. And it provides a combination of reminders, tracking, incentives, educational features, um, and encouragement to help improve his adherence to his, his medication, which is to stay on course. Uh, just going to run through just a quick little simulated demo here. Uh, so he gets, Alex gets uh, uh, reminders on his, his uh, iPad Touch. This is a device that a lot of kids have and are interested in having. Um, so we, we targeted that uh, initially. Uh, gets reminders when it's time to take his medicine. He can quickly respond um, and record that he did take the doses for that day. Um, he can record other information, whether he used his rescue inhaler, and this is important from a clinical standpoint. Um, knowing how, how often kids are using the rescue inhaler is a good sign of whether their asthma is in control or not in control, so it's, it's an important piece of information to be tracking. Um, he can record other information about whether he had an asthma attack, uh, peak flow, which is a, a measure of, of breathing level, uh, can report symptoms. He can uh, track goals, so the goals are something that the parent would set up on the website um, where they would say, specify duration, and if he takes all of his medication doses during that time, uh, he would earn whatever reward, reward that they had set up. They can track those. Um, he can also, um, check his status with what we call a breeze mates. 
And these are cute little quirky characters. And uh, each day he takes his medicine, he earns uh, food for the, for the character, and he can grow them, adopt them. Um, we have a whole collection of about 40 of them. And so it's an extra incentive for him to continue to take his medication to stay on track. Um, just a few quick looks at the website that the parent would use. Um, that's where the medication schedule is set up so it can be customized to the individual. Uh, the parent can track at, at a glance um, the information for that week. They can look at longer term trends. Um, as I mentioned, they can set up the goals and rewards. Uh, they can also generate a report that they can take to the doctors with them that gives information um, about how they've done both taking their medication and also the various uh, uh, problems and symptoms they've had in the, in, in the past duration. Thank you. All right. Questions? Attack button? Does that call someone? No, it doesn't. Oh, okay. It just records that, that they that they had an attack that day. Oh my God, I'm <laughs> No, I think I think we want to encourage people when they're having an attack, they take care of that first. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the profile you had of the target user, but in terms of expanding that a bit, how, what do you think your reach is in terms of sort of socioeconomics, like in terms of the you know, you're going to be able to reach poor kids or middle class um, kids yeah, or rich we, kids we, or what? Yeah, we, we have some experience with that. Um, we are finding a lot of interest in um, Medicaid population. Um, and in that case, because of the, the amount, the cost for the care, there's ER visits and it's out of control. Um, it, this is even cost effective for the insurance provider to provide the device. Um, and so we're, we're, we're gaining a lot of experience there, but we're, we're finding some success in, in making a difference in that. That population. So it's clear you guys have done a lot of work in like in terms of the personal informatics, uh, shaping the path, guiding the rider. Uh, but this is probably one of the first examples I've seen of it for children. Mm -hmm. Have you guys done like uh, usability studies on how the kids respond to something like this? Yeah, we, we, we spent a lot of time both before we um, uh, started coding, just doing some, some design sessions with kids, mm -hmm. and we've had some focus groups with kids since then. Um, we have a lot of, we've found a lot of friends and family who have asthma, so we've, we've been able to observe them. So we've done a lot from a lot of different directions. What's the expected cost savings of using this? Um, if, if kids use it regularly and are able to, to reduce their asthma, um, their ER visits, um, you know, potentially up to seven or eight thousand dollars per year. Um, obviously, not every kid is going to take to this. Um, you know, some will, a good proportion will, and that's really will determine what the overall savings. Um, so we've we've seen um, very in the studies we've done so far, um, we've seen some very good results um, in terms of reduction of ER visits, but they've been very small uh, numbers. And so we're as we start to engage with with more and more of the insurance providers, we're getting more of that information. What if the insurance providers develop comparable technology um, or, you know, if a competitor comes in and tries to do something comparable at a better price point, would you ever be willing to sell directly to consumers or? Um, potentially, long term, we would look at selling to consumers. Um, we sort of started down that path and very quickly realized that wasn't where we were going to, to really find the numbers. And, so we, we've really focused our business model on, on the providers. In the back. Um, I, I noticed a little thing where you motivated the kid by giving him a free pizza party. Mom could motivate the kid by giving him yeah. a free pizza party. Well, it occurred to me that the real person who's saving money is the insurance company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if it might be who to yep. sell it that way is that if the insurance company is saving money, the insurance company might want to offer this kid the incentive. Right. We, because we, we, we've actually had discussions about just that. Yeah. yeah. You know, the kid saved me a thousand bucks and I get yep. a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be quite that large, but yeah. you'd know, be surprised how much you can get done. Right. 
particularly because most health care costs are user optional, shall we say? Mm -hmm. And you know that if the user did certain things, you wouldn't have to. How do you prevent the kids from gaming the system? Like, let's say they forget all day. The, do you establish time periods where you can actually click and take the medication? No. Or can they just at the end of the day say, oh, yeah, I took it off? We don't, although we don't allow them to go back to a previous day. Okay. Um, and, you know, we do, we do recognize that that can be, that can be an issue. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act between making the incentives you know, so enticing that, that they're encouraged to do that. And we, what we also say is, you know, parents, you need to know your kid. If your kid is not likely to be honest on it, then maybe you want to tone down what you're, what you're offering. Um, but at the same time, um, we are finding that most kids are, you know, they take it seriously. They, they, they feel empowered um, by having the tool that they can, can take responsibility. They don't have their parents bugging them as much, um, so they, they have some other incentives not to game the system. All right, that's all the time we have, thank you. Um, so usually we'll do um, community announcements, which means um, basically any events coming up, um, or anything you think the audience here would be interested in, just a very short 30-second uh, uh, pitch um, for an event coming up. Um, we'll uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Mish Sabosky. I'm here with GLEQ tonight, and I have some information about registration for this fall phase. It's a business plan competition, uh, but this phase we're connecting people with a coach and we also have uh, three workshops that we'll be running in multiple places around the state. So if you want information, you can just come find me and I'd be happy to hand that off. Cool, thank you. Well, it looks like our next presenter is ready. Um, if you have any community announcements, um, we'll either do them after this one or at the end. Um, so, um, so Craig, Craig Levovitz uh, from Deepfield, uh, he actually sits right next to me in the tech brewery. Um, so, I'm a little bit familiar with what they do. Um, this is for ISPs and Comcast and maybe. Well, actually, we're not naming customers. Too right, right. <laughs> ISPs and <laughs> service providers and yeah, they may. You, I think you're a little I, too familiar with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let it I'll not say anything. Yeah. So uh, we, we actually can't name any customers. So I'd appreciate if you all, uh, you know, you feel like a judge asking the jury to ignore the evidence of the guilty. But yeah. So. Uh, at any rate, uh, my name is Craig Lackovitz. I'm with uh, Deepfield, which is a fairly new company, and I'll talk about our, our uh, status and our history in another couple of slides. So broadly, the cloud, I read about the cloud every day. The Wall Street Journal loves the cloud. Every day there's a new headline, cloud this, and Amazon, and enterprises, and billions upon billions of dollars of stuff moving the cloud. Great space. I don't know what the cloud means anymore, but I know there's a lot of money there. Wall Street Journal says so. <laughs> but when you talk to a lot of the folks actually operating the infrastructure, the cloud providers, large content, large unnamed carriers and consumer networks in the US, the problems they're facing are staggering. By comparison, they used to have simple networks, simple billing models, simple infrastructure. Now there's stuff running here, there's stuff running there, there's data coming here, and there's just so much data that many of them have so much data they have no idea what's happening. If you ever saw the Three Mile Island uh, movie, I forget the uh, movie back in the 80s, you know, when all the boards light up, they know there's stuff happening. But controlling, managing it, understanding the costs are really hard. And a bewildering array of economic knobs you can turn to try to optimize the infrastructure. You know, if you go to these guys, some days you're not even sure if they're making money or losing money if you go to a large enterprise or anyone with large, complex infrastructure. And if you're running a business, that's kind of a problem. So overall, a lot of money is being thrown into the problem on just being able to manage, control, analyze cloud analytics. Depends who you ask. I, lose, you know, I don't really care if it's two or three or four. It's you know, in the multiple billions upon billions of dollars. So big space going in, not just on the compute side, which the Wall Street Journal writes about, 
but on, on the side of managing, controlling, and analyzing the infrastructure, stuff that's all going in the back end. So what do we do? Deep Field broadly does cloud intelligence, which takes a little bit to explain. We often joke it would be simpler if we were a mobile, not to pick on mobile, but if we were a B2B consumer app and, you know, how it, uh, but we actually uh, work with lar anyone with large cloud compute network infrastructure, allowing them to understand what's happening in their infrastructure in real time, particularly from a cost perspective. Broadly, what do we do? We're big data. Uh, we have a lot of technology around what we call our cloud genome or mapping, and ultimately we sell virtual appliances. So let me just spend a couple slides on big data. Lots of companies do big data. Splunk, which some of you might have heard of, and now has a billion dollar valuation, likes to talk about how they're the king of big data. And Splunk sells in increments of 500 megabits per day, which that's, you know, lots of data to, to be incrementing. Our pricing begins not at 500 megabits today. Our pricing begins at 50 gigabits per second. So to give some idea of the difference in the scale of data we're talking about. By the way, Splunk's a great company. Any company that can go to billion dollar valuation person, Syslog, you know, is, is my book, a fantastic company. So uh, we spend an awful lot of time not just doing big data, but doing what we call the cloud mapping. And one of the key insights we had is that the cloud has a growing and increasing amount of structure. You go to a website, you know, it's been about 10 years since when you went to a website, it actually went to a server sitting at a given address, sitting in an enterprise closet. Today, all major services, whether you're Hulu or Netflix or ESPN, ABC, are being built using many different components, compute components and storage all around the internet, not just sitting in an ESPN data center. In fact, Netflix owns very little infrastructure, as does ESPN. It's all through many different third parties. And it turns out that this structure in the cloud really resembles, at least in the way we think about it, like the human genome DNA. That if you can actually understand these building blocks, it's a really, really valuable source of data for decoding what's happening within a massive data center or with a massive, unnamed US consumer uh, provider, cable provider. So we spent a lot of time doing the mapping. And just to give an example of the mapping, this is somewhat of a recursive example, in that we did a piece with Wired Magazine where we mapped what it looked like if you went to the article about Deepfield. So if you actually go to this website, uh, this is actually what it looks like underneath the hood. And actually bringing up that article would involve many, many different third-party partners and storage and compute sites. So the company, founded in 2011, we're live with paying customers, and we're hiring as fast as we can. With that, five minutes for questions. <laughs> Not a single question. Questions. <laughs> okay, question, thank you. Uh, so, uh, just, yeah, uh, I understand you got a great picture of what's moving around the internet. Uh, and I guess I can see you know, one customer would be somebody who's got the infrastructure just to move all the data. Are there other customers that you're targeting with other value propositions besides just the, the cable guys themselves? Yeah, so are, are the folks we engage with today are uh, some of the guys actually providing the infrastructure. Uh, these are guys like the CDNs, the hosting, and actually the cloud providers themselves. Uh, we're targeting the carriers, the large consumer networks, uh, uh, you know, around, around the world. Uh, we're targeting large enterprise, which are really struggling. You know, one of the revolutions has been stuff that used to be in the, under the lock and key of the data center is now spread all over, and it really scares the CIOs. For example, when Amazon had their outages, you had a number of enterprises that weren't Amazon customers. Ha! They were safe. Amazon outage would never impact them until the Amazon outage occurred. And surprise, they were actually depending on a cyber supply chain, on second and third party suppliers. So enterprises are really trying to understand their cost structure, as well as from a security availability perspective. And we're working with several large enterprises around those infrastructure issues as well. Yes? Uh, you mentioned you're growing and hiring. Like, what functions are you looking for? And uh, where are you at as far as like the sales cycle to all the major CDN providers and everything, like do you need 
additional biz dev or like what's the next step for you guys to go to the next level? Yeah, so we're hiring out our sales team now. Uh, and our hiring manager is sitting in the audience who we're actively looking for, uh, that's Naeem saying, yeah. We're actively looking for uh, UI, UX, as well as back-end cloud developers today with multiple open positions. And we're hiring uh, VP of sales and, and other, other things along those lines as well. So we're, we're done with the technology phase. Uh, we officially launched uh, about three weeks ago, did our press launch. Uh, now we're entering the growth phase. So, um, what are your personal ambitions with Deepfield? You know, what are your, what have you told investors that your exit strategy is going to be? Are you trying to go IPO? I mean, what are, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, just, I used to get asked this when I was at Arbor as well. You know, what are our ambitions? Uh, you always grow a company organically with an eye towards building the best and strongest company you can. At the same time, uh, you'd like to position yourself such as if. You know, a BD uh, event, uh, you know, an exit event, uh, were, were available. Indeed, we're in uh, some fairly high-level BD discussions now. Uh, so, uh, and we haven't officially GA'd our product yet either. So, uh, we're we're trying to keep things in the right order. Uh, one last question: How are we doing? We've got two minutes left, so plenty of time for like a really involved, deep question. Yes. How do your customers use this data to make better decisions? So, uh, you know, our primary focus in sales is bringing data out of the cloud and out of the network into the boardroom. So most of our customers have uh, projects on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars that they're planning on spending. Uh, and that making these decisions today, are they're making them in a vacuum of information. So we're part uh, tied to some of these very large projects. Uh, we also like to provide information not just to the CFO and, and the CTO, uh, but also to the day-to-day -day engineering and operations. So there's an amount of real-time operational aspect to what we, we're doing for the daily role. And then we have a number of companies that are just, you know, the marketing, uh, you know, the advertising, marketing side. So generally, in all the accounts we're involved with, we're involved in, uh, you know, three or four different groups uh, within the organization. And indeed, to get past our initial spend, we, you know, as we get bigger spend, we like to be involved not just in the silo, but be uh, across the organization. Would the problem clear for somebody who is observing cloud, or what is the story? Yeah, so you know, I've been writing about this stuff and doing this stuff, so I think the origins of the stuff has its work in some earlier work I did, earlier research. But basically, I've been involved in the industry since before the internet, working uh, as an engineer in the NSFNet backbone, and then was a chief scientist and the founding architect and built most of Arbor's products. Um, so we're just watching this evolve, and I think what's really exciting is that no time over the last 15 years is the industry more dynamic than it is today and more disruptive in the amount of money flowing into the system and the amount of changes. So it really became clear that there was a lot going on and a lot of problems that weren't being solved. Uh, it, and again, it, it was obvious to, you know, I don't know if it was obvious to everyone, but certainly as obvious as, as to those in the industry. But thank you, I think that's it. Next presenter um, comes all the way from Ohio. Uh, all the way. <laughs> all the way, I know, it's very far. Uh, it's a foreign land. Sometimes we go there first to your point. Um, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's from Bowling Green State University, and uh, he has a product um, that hopes to help uh, students in classrooms. You that? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Anthony Fontana, and um, I. Um, design software and I teach creativity at Bowling Green State University and uh, a couple of years ago I was teaching lectures and students were falling asleep uh, in dark rooms maybe N not totally unlike this one um, and I decided that uh, you know I needed to do something to try and change that and uh, that's when we created Kizbox so here it looks like I'm in a PowerPoint but I am actually in the web browser and this is at a URL that any of you if you can type quick enough can go to uh, and what I've done is I've put my slides next to uh, a chat room, uh, and I'll leave that up just for one more second, and there we go. So uh, during the middle of a lecture, I can ask a question and uh, have students type in their answers. And so, uh, you know, in, in, a, in an art class, I say, you know, this is, this is a plastic bottle. What can you make from this? And you know what I hear? Exactly, dead silence. So I say, okay, everybody, 
tell me two things you can make from this plastic bottle in the chat room, go. And I go from 0% participation to nearly 100% participation. And not just do they just put in one thing, they put in both, because I said you must put two, right? And they know I can see it, and they know that I can go home, and I can track it. And so the chat room um, becomes a way to increase classroom participation. Furthermore, they can take a copy of the slides with them. Uh, no more uploading PowerPoints to Blackboard or whatever you're using. Oh, I forgot. Oh, can you please, 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 teacher, give me a copy of the slides. I don't want to have to take notes or whatever it is. However, we have notes built right in. So you can click on one of the notes, type something over here, click Save. Uh, that can be downloaded later. It can be accessed through the dashboard. Uh, you can share it with the rest of the people in the class. You can email it to just one other user. Uh, large lecture halls, we have this uh, in a 300 person sex ed class this semester and here's an anonymous uh, question area so we can ask, oops, what happened there? So students can ask uh, anonymous questions uh, of each other or uh, to the professor and then we don't have anonymous answers yet uh, but they could answer uh, right under and answer questions and answers are threaded together uh, and then they uh, can also be ranked up or down. Uh, so I could say at the end of a class, hey, what was the toughest, most challenging thing that we covered today? Please give me five questions that might appear on a quiz in the uh, anonymous quiz question area, right? And then they can rank those up and down and I can find out what was the most challenging material from the day. I can have the students or TAs answer those questions and create a study guide right there on the spot. Um, we also have, how, how many people here are familiar with clickers? Right, so uh, it's hardware, right? It's something you have to buy, and yet we have, you know, this clicker right in our pocket, uh, or a laptop we've already brought to class. And so this is a web app, again, because I'm in a browser, right, and it turns into a clicker. Um, and so I don't think I'm going to have anybody answer that one, because nobody's in the chat room right now. Uh, besides that, uh, I can pull up the roster, and I did see one person logged in, so they're gonna get an award for attending uh, my lecture today at the New Tech Meetup. I'll just give you a smiley face for now. I've already given that. And then uh, when they go to their dashboard, they can click share on their award. And of course, hey, mom, look, I did really well in class today. Or, <laughs> you know, brag to your buddies, your friends, or um, other people you're Facebooking with. Uh, Twitter integration is on our list. Uh, currently, it looks great on an iPad, uh, mobile phone, mobile development, getting it uh, working really great on the small screen is our step for this semester, as well as some uh, much deeper uh, gamification features. Uh, so I'm going to skip over some of the stuff that I already ran through. Uh, grades, all the grades from a quiz can be downloaded, scored and stored. We're going to work on sending those to your Blackboard or learning management system. We've got new badges. Uh, I already talked a little bit about the awards. And so uh, we have a new uh, game, version two gamification system we're building where users earn experience points just for interacting with the content on the screen. So asking questions, answering questions, um, uh, social points for working in the chat room, uh, answering quiz pop-ups, clicker pop-ups, um, and all of this can be then uh, you know, put into metrics that can be provided to the instructor. Right? So I can know that Brian attended uh, the new tech meetup today, but wasn't very active uh, when it came to answering the questions. He was here, he logged in, uh, and or, you know, where someone else like Brian was very active in the chat room, asked a couple questions, answered other people's questions. In fact, he answered one of the questions that got ranked up really high, which meant it was a more challenging question. Uh, and so he was helping provide an answer for that. Um, and then, we have classes, just like any good video game, right? So uh, you get classes based on what part you're interacting with, and then you can ac actually offer bonuses to other students. So if I'm a really good note taker, I'm going to be like highest ranked, you know, experience points on the note taker, right? Yet my friend's not doing very well at all. And I say, hey, take notes today, and I'll give you a plus 10 bonus to your note taking, right? Uh, and so he's had an added incentive to take notes, uh, maybe score a little bit higher in that area. Uh, we've been uh, in beta at Bowling Green State University for uh, two semesters, uh, last uh, December or last fall of 2011, spring of 2012, 15 classes, over 600 users so far, and uh, as of next week we will then be in uh, public beta release, uh, and so uh, there will be a link right here on our page to download this. It's a one-year beta licensing agreement. Uh, you have admin level security, you can hook in your LDAP uh, functionality, you can sign in with uh, Facebook, 
and or you can um, create your own login portal through Kizbox. We have that uh, functionality set up. Uh, as I said, the gamification 2.0 features and the mobile version so that it looks much better on the small screen uh, of the smartphone, uh, that'll be done by the end of this semester. Does that end my time for presentation? Yep. Uh, okay. Let's switch. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, so it seems like a great platform for learning. Have you ever thought about you know, opening this up to more use cases, possibly allowing people on the web to learn together? You know, maybe you have a, you know, somebody write an article and then you start the group learning process where people add more content. Yeah, well, uh, right now you know, we currently focus around uh, discussions and uh, slideshows, right? So I could throw a document up over there uh, because in my personal opinion, right, uh, it's, it's social reading that will, you know, really bring students back to reading because students don't read, right? Uh, I mean, it's just a given. Students are asked to buy textbooks. They don't buy textbooks. They don't read the textbook, textbooks, right? Uh, so social reading could be used with this application. I think there uh, needs to be some uh, tweaks to that in the roadmap for where we're going next. Um, as well as once we go, once we have the more mobile platform, I think discussions and or other sort of just pop-up events that are already built into this system could be spliced out um, for individual use case scenarios like you're talking about. Uh, reading is just one of them. Right now we have the lecture, we have the chat room, we have the notes, we have all sorts of other components. We'd like to add a whiteboard to that side. Um, but again, those are in our future roadmap, and I think right now we're just at, at this particular stage is done, and we'd like to get it out and see how many people can use it in a, in a classroom. Yeah. Who owns the uh, intellectual property here, and what are the goals for commercializing it? Excellent question. Uh, so uh, as a university instructor, I own a certain portion, and then the university owns the rest. Uh, and so we are working with our Bowling Green State University uh, Copyright Committee and legal transfer and that sort of thing. And they will come to a decision at the end of this semester about uh, the future of this, of this property. Uh, at which time, you know, we, we will either license it and or offer, um, offer it as a, you know, certain we have, we'll have a point of sale uh, for university licensing, institutional licensing, or just individual licensing. licensing. Um, and so we're sort of looking at all of those models right now as well as just uh, giving it away, right? Uh, just uh, open source or um, making it free. Yes? Uh, two questions. One would be, and the most important is, do you have any metrics at this point that this really actually improves student, student performance at the end of the semester? Okay, so And then we, the, sec the second one would be, uh, from a maturity standpoint, I wonder how much traction you really get with gaming symbols for, you know, like, like the previous one with the eight-year-old. Well, if you perform, you get a gold star. I mean, right. How does that really work? Okay, so first question is, is uh, the, the uh, quantitative research has begun between myself, another professor named Tim Brackenberry, and another one called Dan Pavick. And essentially, we're putting together the metrics so that we can try and prove some of what this does, right? Um, I, who saw me give out the award and who wanted one as soon as I gave one out? Right? Yes? Hands? Okay. Good. So maybe a third of the audience, right? Now, in a classroom, if I were to say, hey, this system gives out badges and I might give you one, who would want one? I'd get about a third of the hands, right? But if I walk into a classroom and I just say, you know, and I teach art, so I show a big red color field painting, I said, who, who painted this? Or what's modernism? You know, raise your hand. And they say, oh, great, here's a badge. Now who wants one, right? And it's more than half of the hands every single time. And the other half, or the other third or whatever's left that doesn't raise their hands, they're the ones raising their hands the next time I answer a question, ask a question, right? So uh, I think people lie about how disinterested they are in gamification, right? Um, because when it's on the spot and I'm like, hey, I've got a word for you. Do you want it? Do you have the answer? They're like, yes, I have the answer, right? So I believe it works. Um, and I believe it works really well because I've been using this in my class. I've been using it for three semesters over a year and a half. Um, and I've seen that it works. Uh, we just have to get the get the get it into classrooms, and get other people testing it. Um, part of this, you know, getting it out for the year, you know, whatever university you're at here as well. You know, we'd like to get it out, and we'd like other people to do those studies as well, and find out how to use it effectively, what works and what doesn't work. Um, that chat room is open, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, jump on in. So that's um, yeah. Go ahead and ask questions, but he'll have to answer them later because time's out. Um, thank you. Uh, 
Um, so t tonight, after the meeting, um, we usually go out somewhere um, for drinks, uh, to eat. Um, so tonight, I suggest uh, we head over to Dominic's afterwards. Um, we don't have a reservation, but um, there'll probably be space for us over there. So, um, And they, they also said um, that they'll be opening up the uh, second floor. Um, so if you don't see us on the first floor, head up there. Um, and for those who don't know where Dominic's is, you can either ask someone else, or um, it's basically directly that way. Um, so if you go out those doors, um, there's a road, and it's the second, basically, house on the left. And our next presenter, um, protein. Pro it's kind of like protein, but it's spelled differently with a little thing on the A. I could not figure it out. But uh, they have this awesome technology that sounds really cool, and I kind of want it, so. Hi, guys. My name is Chris. I'm the COO and co-founder of Protean. Uh, Tiago, I'm not Tiago, as you can see there. He was going to present today, but unfortunately had to run out of state last second, so I'm standing in for him. Um, but anyway, before I get to the presentation, I just wanted to say we're actually new to the area. We moved into the tech brewery uh, about a month ago. So far, we're loving the Ann Arbor scene, and we're really excited to be here. So let me tell you guys a little bit more about what we've been up to. Um, we are developing a powered card called Echo. Echo is a standard card dimensions, just like your debit card or your credit card, and it has an embedded microprocessor. Now, Echo can replace all the rest of the cards in your wallet. Here's how. It can turn into your debit card, your credit card, your student ID, your loyalty cards. Any card with a magnetic stripe on the back, which is this little thing right here, um, our card, Echo, can mimic. Now, what's really cool about Echo is that it actually communicates with your mobile phone via Bluetooth. So a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Google Wallet. There are a lot of big names right now that are currently trying to develop mobile wallet apps. Well, we're going to have a mobile wallet app that will work with the existing payment infrastructure because it communicates through Echo. Now, uh, you don't, that means that you don't need to wait you know, four or five years or however long it takes for NFC to take off and be widely accepted. You can start using our mobile app today. Um, so anyway, why would you want a card like Echo? Well, first of all, uh, Echo is not going to look like the rest of your cards. Uh, we've been extremely design focused, um, and we kind of show you a teaser of what our card may look like on the first page. But suffice to say, it is not going to be a plastic card, um, and I think that's all that will say on the matter for now. Uh, additionally, Echo will enable you to reduce you know, the six or more cards that a lot of people carry around down to just one. So it reduces wallet clutter. Uh, it's great if you like to carry around a money clip. Um, and really, we think it just contributes to a good payment experience. Furthermore, you'll have all of your cards with you at all times as long as you have Echo. So that means that you don't have to miss out on uh, you know, gaining loyalty points or rewards points for those in-store cards that a lot of us just leave at home and forget to bring with us. Um, you know, merchants also benefit because when you use those in-store cards, they pay much lower fees to accept payment. Uh, merchants actually pay between 2 to 3% to accept the standard Visa or MasterCard, but when you use their in-store cards, they pay a whole lot less. So anyway, let me tell you guys a little bit more about uh, how Echo works. So when you purchase Echo, you can download our app for free. When we ship Echo to you, we actually ship it with um, a magnetic stripe reader dongle that plugs into let me grab it out of here. your mobile phone, uh, like so. Uh, it's kind of like a square reader. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, and you can just swipe your information into the phone. Um, but the card information doesn't actually stay on the phone. For security reasons, we send it directly into the card itself. Um, we kind of got demo here. This isn't a real thing. This is a plastic card. But um, it actually goes into secure memory and Echo itself. Um, and uh, um, so when it's in, in the secure memory, basically I'm actually getting a little bit ahead of myself here. I should mention that you can't actually put any cards into Echo without first verifying that you, in fact, own those cards. So we actually validate your uh, identity using your driver's license, and we use our app to do that. So the only cards you can put into Echo are actually cards that belong to you. Um, so basically, our device it cannot be used as a card skimmer. You can only put cards in that do, in fact, belong to you. Now, once you get all of your cards into Echo, um, you don't actually have to use the card reader anymore. You can leave that behind at home. Um, and you basically use the app to tell Echo which card to mimic um, because you know, you've got all of your card information stored on Echo and you've got, you know, you've got, you can actually control which card Echo mimics with the mobile app. 
However, you actually don't even need your mobile app most of the time because Echo actually has three touch sensors on it that are already associated with three preloaded cards of your choice. So for example, slot one, touch sensor one, could be your uh, debit card. Sensor two could be your most commonly used credit card. And sensor three could be your student, you know, your student ID. So basically we think, we hope that most people put their three most commonly used cards on. And then the user experience is as easy as this. You tap the card to activate. Um, you select which card you want. Um, and basically you can use it just as you would any other magnetic strike card. Um, you can hand it off to a waitress, you can swipe it yourself, it works exactly the same way. Um, if you want a card that hasn't already been preloaded, you just go into the app, you select the card you want, and again, it's good to go. I should also mention that we have a built-in security feature. If your card goes out of range of Bluetooth, it actually automatically locks down. You can access it by entering in a PIN code, so you can use it without, our mobile app, uh, without your mobile phone. However, if you do lose your card, it, your information will be protected because the card will lock down. Um, and finally, this is kind of our goofy slide, but we get a little bit of unexpected press coverage on TechCrunch, and you know, and it's as excited as we are about this, we were really excited to see that a lot of other people really got pretty excited too. Um, so, you know, we're, we're pretty, uh, you know, excited about where we're headed, but that's, that's about it, I'm out of time. Um, I'm happy to hear whatever questions you guys may have. Back. The security concerns uh, of having my credit card on a blank card, yeah. you know, is, is a bit of a concern. But I can see a tremendous application for your customer loyalty situation. Mm -hmm. That, to me, I, you know, every place I go, they want me to carry their card. Yeah. And I carry three of them, and the rest of them are sitting in my briefcase. And if I feel like pulling them out, I might. Yeah. But I rarely ever pick them and pull them out. That's right. And, and here's the concept is, is that that was sold, marketed as a, as a, a one-up. One covers everything mm -hmm. for all these different courtesy cards. I mean, customer loyalty cards. That's a phenomenal. I mean, it, it, the marketplace for that is just absolutely huge. Yeah, that's how we feel. I mean, I, I don't I like using it as my credit card, but uh, <laughs> I, I do like the concept of, of using it as customer loyalty. You know, our goal is really to ensure that our card is more secure than the standard cards you carry around. Um, so, hopefully, you know, over time we alleviate the security concerns when security problems don't arise because we've thought all that through. Anybody else have a question? In the back? How do you deal with sensitivity issues when you hand your card off to someone like a waitress? Sensitivity, okay. So, as I mentioned before, this is, this is part of the solution here. Um, the card actually normally is asleep. We actually do this primarily to conserve battery life, but it also presents mistaken, you know, changing what the card is set to mimic, right? So before you can actually reselect a card, you need to tap it like that again, so you see that light up, that shows it activated. And then once you select a card, it immediately goes back to sleep, and when it swipes, it wakes up to send out the signal, but that's it. So if the waiter picks it up, you know, this is a little bit more sensitive than the final one will be, but I'll show you in a second when the light goes off. Um, you know, when you just go like that, it, it doesn't do anything. It's actually attuned to the frequency, so it actually needs a tap to go off. So that's really the biggest part of it. Um, anyone else? Right there? Um, is the delay between the time, like, say, a waitress swiping your card and you actually seeing, and I'm assuming you can see the, the total in, the, in your app, is the delay between those two points in time any quicker than the delay between the waitress swiping your card and the, like, on my debit card seeing as a pending transaction? So you say you can see the total in your app. You actually can't see the total in your app. You can see that the transaction took place in the app, but this is basically we're, we're using the current payment infrastructure. It's just, you know, the card itself just sends information, secure card information to the terminal. No information comes back to the card. Um, is that by design or is that just well, it's not by that's just the way the technology works. You know, in the future, if you actually, you know, with like Google Wallet or something, you're actually communicating back and forth with the terminal. You know, our phone, your, our app communicates with the card, but when the card goes through, it can't take information back. That's just the way the drive readers work. Yeah. Right there. Any idea how much it will cost? Excuse me? How much will it cost? Okay, well, we are hoping to launch on Kickstarter uh, winter of this year, and we're probably going to have a launch price of 80 to to $100. Anyone else? Right there? Yeah, so I, I love the card. I love your idea. Um, will I be able to track my card if I lose it? You know, can I see where it is through my phone? 
Not, not at launch. That might be something we'll try to do in the future. Um, unfortunately, we're trying to cram a whole lot of uh, technology into a very small amount of space. These cards are uh, about 0.8 millimeters thick, and we have a cavity space because we need to encode it. We have a cavity space of about 0.45 millimeters, and there's a lot in there. We unfortunately don't have room to, you know, add anything that would allow us to do that. But that may be something we'd like to do in the future. Good question. Right there. Um, yeah, I like the idea. I can anticipate that merchants who are unfamiliar with it might be reluctant to accept it, not knowing, hey, that's not yeah. a real card. Yeah. Is there any kind of, you know, visual component to, you know, sort of set the, you know, sort of looks more like the card you're using, or you know, what, what other things can you do to make the mm -hmm. merchant who's unfamiliar be comfortable with it? Yeah, well, part of it is we'll have the name of every owner of this card. It will actually be on the card itself. Um, so that's part of it. It's personalized in that sense. Um, we'll have an, an, uh, an e-paper display on the back that will display the CEV code. Um, and another thing that I would like to mention is that um, there are a lot of card standards. However, there are more and more cards these days that deviate from those norms. Um, I don't know if any of you have a Chase Sapphire, but the, the embossed card numbers are actually on the back. Um, and so merchants are used to seeing a variety of sort of unusual cards. We think that our card will look very nice and look very professional. So we hope that, you know, it won't raise too many alarms for cashiers. All right, that's, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you. Can I just say one more thing? And I have some info sheets right here that I'll leave in the front. And if you guys have any questions you didn't get a chance to ask me, feel free to shoot me an email. There's an email on that sheet. I'll also leave some business cards. Thanks, guys. Cool. All right, thanks for coming to AT New Tech. Uh, before we leave, um, are there any other community announcements, uh, events, or? So uh, I'm, uh, we, we actually are, are probably moving out of the brewery shortly. Um, my, my company upstairs, uh, we were growing, out, outgrowing the space, uh, and all the, all the available suites on the second floor. And so it's likely that we'll have some other folks moving up, and um, which means that we'll, we'll actually be finally putting a dent in the, the wait list. And so if there are folks that would like to come and, and join the brewery, um, definitely let me know. Um, we're happy to, happy to get you on, and it's probably more likely that we'll be able to take more folks now. Else? Hi everyone, my name is Matt Logan. I'm a freshman or a first year at Ross, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, I'm helping to organize uh, Clean Web Hackathon. I think, we're th think it's going to be the first weekend in November. And the basic idea is that uh, IT solutions can be applied to uh, energy and environmental problems, resource constraints. Um, so if you're interested in applying IT to clean tech problems, uh, come talk to me afterwards. Um, so one announcement that uh, the founder of Develop Detroit wanted me to announce. Um, Develop Detroit is um, basically a training program to teach uh, iOS, iOS development. Um, it happened in Detroit. Um, it's going to happen in Lansing. Um, the Detroit one's just finishing up, and Demo Day um, is coming up. Um, I, I think it's next week. Um, but if you're interested in more information on that, um, devdebt.eventbrite.com um, or devdebt.com. Um, and if you're interested in this happening in Ann Arbor as well, um, email the founder. Uh, his email is at the bottom of the page. Anybody else? All right, great. Uh, that's it for this episode of uh, HNU Tech. Um, we'll be headed over to uh, Dominic's in just a couple minutes. Um, and feel free to stick around here for networking. Thanks.